everyone, welcome. We'll just give a moment or two so you can get connected easily. All right, I can see many familiar names. Hello, everyone. So we have, um, I think, UK, we have uh, obviously Los Angeles, um, we have Spain, I think we have Brazil, if I'm not wrong. Uh, many people from, from the West Coast, of course. Well, if you want, you can just let us know from where you're connecting. Um, oh, wow, we have Turkey. Oh, and Hawaii, that's awesome. Hi, guys. <laughs> and Ecuador, hey. okay. <laughs> this looks like um, Olympics, not uh, Mystica webinars. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so while you let us know from where you're connecting in, uh, I would just like to say hello. Uh, my name is Eva, and in the name of LGO team, I would like to welcome you to this very special Mystica 10 Masterclass. Uh, many thanks for joining us today. Um, just some practical information before we begin. Um, I would suggest you setting your Zoom screen to, um, to a full screen because uh, you'll uh, see better all the magical things that Jeff will be showing in Mystica. And if you have any questions during the, um, the session, I suggest you to place them in the, um, in the Q&A panel that you can find in the lower tab of Zoom window. Um, we'll make sure to cover them at the end of the session. So today we have a very unique opportunity of hosting filmmakers of the short CGI feature, feature film Death and the Lady, which got selected for this year's Tribeca Festival. Please welcome the director of the movie, Jeff Bailey, DP Paul Nichols, and colorist and finishing, finishing artist Jeff Sosa. Welcome, guys. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. So um, first, congratulations on the movie. Of course, it looks absolutely stunning. And um, Jeff, why don't we start with you? You were the one creating the movie from A to Z, basically. So could you tell us a little bit more about it? And why did you decide to make it in the first place? Um, we, my wife and I started writing it uh, a couple of years ago uh, and we started producing it before COVID uh, and the lockdown, but the lockdown coincided with, uh, with production. So it became, you know, became one of the ways we stayed sane that and conversations with our dogs, uh, which is debatable whether that kept us sane. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, so it was an interesting, we started before COVID and then continued production through the, the lockdown, um, you know, and I don't know how much it changed. We had the story, but we, I definitely think the experience of the lockdown affected the tone of it. Um, and certainly the, the emotional content of it. I mean, the film is definitely about um, maybe not accepting, but learning to live with loss and the importance of, of coming to terms with loss of all kinds and uh, the importance of, being loved and loving and in the midst of all of that. Um, so that was kind of the impetus behind it. And then um, probably more relevant to what we're discussing here today, I think the other thing, I've always had a pet peeve about um, CG animation in particular kind of character animation that in a medium where you can literally do anything that it seems like all of CG animation has narrowed into a very particular look and feel defined largely by one particular studio. Um, so we tried to find, you know, I was interested in doing something different. I've been very interested by in the Brothers Quay uh, stuff from the eighties and nineties, which was very stop motion, very tactile, filmed with real characters, with real cameras. Um, and also was really interested in the work. Uh, I was really inspired by Rango, if people have seen it, Gore Verbinski's animated feature film, which is wonderful. Um, and if you look at the behind the scenes, they approached it like they were shooting a feature. They shot mm -hmm. the actors live as reference animation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul. I, Roger Deakins, I believe, was the DP for it. Um, and so that's how we approached it, as if we were shooting a live action film. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. 
are you planning to show us a little bit um, of, of the footage? Um, I'm sure that people would love to see it. We had some yeah, images. Played. Okay, perfect. This yeah. is, we can continue talking, but this is the uh, trailer for the film and the first shot. Um, and then it goes into some, you'll see some early animation and effects tests, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some early lighting tests that Paul and I did on a couple of shots. just while we're while we're watching I'll just for people who are interested uh we did I basically did all of uh I had some help with a good friend of mine Erica Lee on the character design um but from there on out pretty much all of the animation the modeling animation effects work um texturing into the lighting which Paul helped on uh I did myself we used for modeling all of the um, all of the modeling rigging and animation was done in Blender, and then we ported everything over to Houdini um, for all the character effects, additional effects work, um, texturing, and then lighting, and rendered out of Houdini using Redshift. Oh wow! Yeah, that's amazing. So, and these are some early, just, just early effects, effects tests. So Paul, you were involved as a DP, as uh, we mentioned. Um, why don't you share a little bit of your experience um, working on this project? Okay. Um, so I come from primarily live action background. Um, I came up to the lighting department um, I've done a lot of narrative work. I've done a lot of documentary work, but this is my first uh, CG experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Jeff said, there's a lot of other DPs that are known primarily for narrative work that do DP work on CG features. Roger Deakins on uh, on Rango is probably the best example. Um, Jeff and I have done a bunch of other projects together. Um, all of which have been live action. Uh, so this was exciting to do since it's something I've never done before. Um, and it also came up at like exactly the right time because as Jeff said, it helped keep me sane during mm -hmm. the shutdown. Um, I had been shooting a show, a series for CNN that shut down after one week because of COVID and I was sitting around in my apartment with nothing to do and no idea when I was going to go back. And we talked about Beth and, and the lady and uh, it was great to be able to just have that creative outlet and focus on it. Um, and we had a great time with it. Um, working in the, in the, in this kind of space is, uh, it's new in that um, you get to do things that you, you would not be able to do in physical sense. And it's amazing. And it was, like an eye opener for me. And it was like, I almost never wanted to go back where I could <laughs> okay. put a light, I could put a light in the frame and have it light a subject. And then with a click, the light disappears, but the effect stays, you know, and basically saying like, we want this light to hit just, um, just Jackson, the dog, but nothing else, you know, mm -hmm. and that would be on set. That would be an hour and a half worth of flagging from the grip so you control the light and it doesn't hit anything else but that one subject. And, you know, and also they can move through the space and it still stays only on them. So that was a revelation to me and that was a ton of fun. And I got to do things that I've never been able to do before and it was exciting. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a totally new experience. It was amazing. 
um, we were, we were able to dial the look in very close to where we wanted it. And mm -hmm. I kind of didn't think that we would have that much to do in the final color correction because we had so much control going through the lighting process. Mm -hmm. um, but then we got to the color correction and stuff that Jeff was able to do just made it even, you know, just sweetened the look of it and made it even that much better. Um, so yeah, from start to finish, it was a totally new experience. So yeah, color Safe. grading um, process was a little bit my my next question for you because uh, you said this was your first experience with the CGI media. Uh, so um, how was the whole final look creation and you know the great supervision from from your point of view? So we really did approach it kind of like a live action mm -hmm. short. Um, you know, we got the look pretty close to where we wanted it. Um, and then when we got to the color correction, it was really just enhancing different things, you know, bringing out a little more green and the light over the, the oven in the kitchen and stuff like that. Like we, we were in going in the right direction. We were pretty close to being there. And then Jeff just, you know, brought it the rest of the way home across the finish line. Um, it was great. Yeah, it, it was, it was very similar to the normal experience, just with mm -hmm. even a little more control, which was, Fantastic. Which always comes uh, handy <laughs> working on those yeah. kind of projects. So Jeff, you Absolutely. said that um, you are the happiest when you can blend a little bit of narrative filmmaking with CG design, and of course, Death and the Lady was just uh, was just that. Um, how how was the whole transitioning process from uh, from Nuke, and then obviously you learned Blender and all those different um, um, all those different programs. And then, of course, you needed to come to Mystica. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I have a background uh, as a commercial director. Um, I do a lot of work that blends design with live action. Um, Paul and I, as Paul said, Paul and I have worked on a number of live action projects together, uh, both films and commercial stuff. Jeff and I have uh, colored many projects. We actually just finished a project, an installation for the museum uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, commemorating the massacre that happened there 100 years ago. Um, so a lot of the things that we've done together and that I've done in my professional career kind of came into this film. Um, but I'd never done a CG character animation mm -hmm. uh, project before. So that was all new. Um, but I had a lot of experience with the, the technology uh, in other regards. Uh, it was pretty seamless. What was, I think, one of the most interesting things for the from the color point of view was that we didn't, I was expecting to do a pretty traditional color grade. Um, and it was only when I started talking to Jeff that he mentioned Mystica and Mystica's ability to, to read EXR passes and generate additional levels of control from that. Um, so we did not plan for it, which is, I think, a really interesting thing. I think... What you're looking at here that Jeff's sharing is a pretty standard utility pass. So uh, we do um, uh, almost all of our my renders. I'll do a separate beauty pass that has all the traditional passes you think of, diffuse light, specular, reflections, refractions, et cetera. And then I'll do a separate render um, that's all the utility passes. And that includes um, object IDs uh, or cryptomat uh, as a way of singling out individual objects. It'll include normals. Uh, it'll include motion vectors and depth. And initially, all I did was turn that over. I turned the, we turned the final comps over to Jeff mm -hmm. and then just gave him the utility pass that we already had. So it was literally no extra work for us, mm -hmm. um, which is really impressive. Now, we were partly able to do that because we weren't really doing any additional scaling or um, things in comp. So they lined up the, the utility pass and the beauty passes lined up uh, well. But if we had been planning for it, we very easily could have run those passes through Nuke, uh, through the pipeline in Nuke, so that mm -hmm. at the end, you would have ended with a normals pass. In this case that you're looking at, um, that would have matched the final comp uh, without too much work. And that is so much easier. If anybody's worked in, in post and in comp, the process of kicking out like Luma mats at the end of a project for the colorist is the most tedious thing in the world anywhere. 
Um, you're already on another job. You don't want to be working. The colorist is always bothering you for another map that they need. Yeah. And you just don't want to deal with it. You've got other things to do at that point. Um, and it really, it really simplifies the process. It's just from a, a pipeline standpoint, it was pretty magical. And then you get the benefit that Jeff will talk about of really a, a level of control that you normally don't, don't have in the color session. That's great, yeah. So, um, of course, Paula already mentioned that the whole color grading uh, process was a little bit um, more focused not into finding a new look, but uh, more of enhancing the, the light that it's already there. Um, so, Jeff, why don't you take us a little bit through the process that you did in Mystica? Sure, uh, absolutely. So we're actually going to look at the shot that Jeff had shown, Jeff Bailey had shown in the trailer, and we're mm -hmm. going to grade it up from scratch. What you're looking at right now, um, what I was showing now, was the utility passes that Jeff Bailey had generated for me. Now, this is the information in an EXR that Mystica is going to convert into a depth map, which is going to allow us to create selections and target particular parts of the image. Um, I'm in the time space right now. Before I jump into the visual editor, just to kind of set the table a little bit, mm -hmm. this is the shot we're going to be working on. Underneath it is the utility pass. And then the utility pass has a color grade node. And that is what's going to extract the key and then send it to my main color grade node. These are all color grade nodes that I've enabled, uh, relabeled. Um, and then that is where we are going to go ahead and grade. So let's go ahead and jump into the first shot right here. Uh, let me back that off. All right. Um, so let me jump into the first shot right here. Now, what you see right here is the shot as it comes from, in this case, Nuke. What you see right here is with the color grade on. Okay. Now, before I go into showing how we did the little mats, let me just sort of explain that we did have a little bit of an overall look that we gave this. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff, you had done a lot in Nuke, right? Yeah, I think we had done a film little film emulation and a little adjustments that we passed off to you as a lot. Cool. So... Um, we did just real sim simple. You can see this here in the bands. Basically, we had done a little bit of a push-pull of cold in the shadows and warm in the highlights. So this is before, and then this is after, you know, simplest thing in the world. And then we also, um, in the fixed vectors, had done a little bit of a rotation towards gold, what I look, uh, kind of renamed as a gold cast right here. So this is the before on that, and that's the after. You can see it if you kind of get like really close like this. That's the before. And that's the after. So everything just gets a little bit more palette controlled, like a little bit more orange. So mm -hmm. this node I labeled tone, this is on everything. This is sort of like show LUT, like a modification of the look that uh, Jeff and Paul had already set that we dialed in. So from there, you know, like Paul said, the look was kind of done. You know, if we had not done a color session, I'm 100% sure this would still be in Tribeca um, and, and, and doing well. So it's really just a chance to enhance. Um, and the word that really jumps to mind for me is um, embellish. You're taking the lighting uh, and you're taking things that are already there mm -hmm. and you're just sweetening it. It's just like adding like a little, a, a little bit of spice. All right. So let's jump in here. And basically what we're going to do is start to isolate certain parts of the image and enhance them with the matte information. And I think, you know, as Jeff said, we weren't even, we had the utility passes, like we weren't sure if we were going to use them, but I think, Paul, it's, it's kind of started with you. We were looking at this shot together. I mean, we we're talking about the moonlight and we were talking about, is there any opportunity to enhance the moonlight coming in from the window? And we said, okay, so how do you do that in traditional grade? Well, obviously you're not gonna wanna do it overall. You're going to grab a power window like this you're going to add a little bit of feathering. And then inside of that power window, you're going to do a little bit of a push towards blue like that. So let me on off that for you. So this is the before and that's the after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's good. But, but of course, it's changing the color of the, the record player. It's changing from this nice gold. And so this is where in a typical color session, you sort of throw up your hands because how are you going to get the wall to be blue, but not alter the... Uh, not alter the gramophone. So let's go ahead and let's leave this enabled. I'm gonna just remove this power window temporarily so everything's getting blue right now and think how are we gonna isolate this with a depth mat that we're gonna get from um, basically from the utility pass. So let's jump over to the actual utility pass and we're going to go into the multi-layer EXR 
qualifier. So we're going to go to qualifier. And you have this M layer down here. This is the multi-layer EXR tool. Um, and you notice you have a few different eyedroppers up here, which is going to allow you to make pick selections on the image to target what you want. Um, now, the first thing that we're going to do, what I find actually always the most helpful, is we're going to start with this picker that says dir for direction. That's the normals pass. It's going to affect the directions of the light. And then you have sort of two other drop down menus to take care of here. The first is passes. We're going to go ahead and switch this to directional light. And then under layer, we are going to pick N for normals. All right. And now we are going to click on the image and we're going to go into highlight mode. And this is going to show us the mat. So for those of you who don't know, I mean, this is just like doing a skin qualifier. Whatever's white is going to get affected. Whatever's black is going to not get affected. And then anything that's gray is going to be somewhat affected. The lighter it is, the more it's affected, the darker it is, um, the less it's affected. So as you can see, it's quite interactive. I can just, I'm just clicking and dragging and holding. And then just depending on where I click, that is receiving the light. So you're shining a light at that point. So if I want to hit the sidewall, which we don't, I would click on the sidewall. If I want to hit the cat, we can hit the cat. When I hit ladies bonnet, we can do that fireplace. In this case, we want to hit the wall because the moonlight is coming in and hitting the wall. Okay. So we're going to go out of highlight mode and we're going to pop back. Uh, we're going to enable the whole grade and we're going to go to our, now it's really not just normals. I've relabeled this color grade node as normals, but really this is the node that I use for all of the depth mats. I probably should have called it depth mats, but we were kind of faking our way through it. Um, so if I turn this on and off now, you'll see now, aha, okay. So only that wall is getting affected, but the grammar, the record player is still getting affected and we're hitting too large of an area. Mm -hmm. So we're now going to add depth to this. So let's jump back down um, to where we're making our selection. Let's go back to the qualifier mode, back to highlight modes. So we're seeing what we're affecting. And this is where it's kind of interesting. So these eyedroppers, they aggregate. So these are not, if I'm now going to go to Z, Z is for depth, and I'm going to change the pass because I want to look at depth, and I'm going to tell it what layer that depth is stored on, which is Z, okay? So now what I'm going to do is click on the background. And so now we're basically, we're adding the selection from normals, and we're now adding um, a layer of depth here. So we can already see we're excluding a lot of things from the foreground. This is where you're gonna wanna go in and finesse. So if we really wanna keep this selection off of the record player, we are going to do a few things. First, you should always do a little bit of softness. So I'm gonna click on the softness um, and I'm just gonna just increase it a little bit. That's probably fine. The shortcut for this is Alt, by the way. If you hold Alt when you hit up and down, that's gonna give you like really fine control. If you don't hit Alt, it's gonna to be uh, too much. And now where it says depth, I'm going to hold Alt and I'm going to press up and I'm sending this to the background. Up, 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 done. So basically, you know, if I pull it toward the foreground, I could, you know, if we wanted to hit only the record player, <laughs> but this is going to hit only the background now. So we've completely eliminated it's black. It's not getting affected by that moonlight. So let's go back to the main grade. We're going to come out of highlight mode. So this is sort of the party trick here. So this is before, sorry, I've been actually not in the normal layer. So this is before, and then this is after. So this is before, and this is after. So we've managed to kind of put moonlight on the wall, mm -hmm. but retain the actual blue of the record player. Now, a few other things here. First of all, um, I think we had the color is a little too magenta. So while I've got you on the call, I'll just go ahead and correct it a little bit more of a slate blue. Yeah, that's matching a little bit better there for what we actually want coming in from the wall. Now, one cool thing is you can actually combine the depth mats with your traditional shapes in Mystica or with a traditional qualifier. So we can actually now go ahead and limit this with a power window here. So that would sort of be like the sort of, uh, you know, complete uh, grade there. So if I, you know, turn off the normals like that, they go away. If I come back, we have slate blue, moonlight coming in from the window limited to this part of the room and not hitting the record player. There's a few other corrections that we did. I'm going to move on and do those as well. Um, so we went ahead and we looked at, um, we looked at 
how to use depth and how to use normals, we're now going to look at something else, which is called um, world world position. So let's go into our next um, depth mat here. We're going to go to the qualifier. We're going to go to the multi-layer. And now we're going to try this other one that says X, Y, Z. And this is going to give us what's called world position. So I'm going to go ahead into the layer and go to, um, well, I'm going to change my pass to position. Now that I've changed my pass to position, um, under layers, I can go ahead and pick P. We can go into, aha, uh -huh. so we already see a selection here. I can go into the highlight mode and now I can click. And as you see, I'm sort of like moving around a spherical blob that's going to catch um, everything like in its radius. Um, so just like with, uh, just like with the depth, I'm going to increase the softness here. And just increasing the softness alone is giving like a much better sense of what's actually being selected here. I think I'm going to move the uh, center. Let's move the center here. I'm pushing it towards the background. And what I'm going for here is I really want to emulate that light, that practical lamp that Paul and Jeff set up that's creating an orange light. I really want to enhance that. So it's a complementary color to the moonlight that's coming in there. Um, so let's go ahead and mess with its size. Oops. Let's mess with the size. Yeah, I think something like that. Let's do size Y, yeah, something like that. And then let's increase the softness here. Okay, let's have a look at how that mat is gonna play. So let's go back, let's enable the grade. Let's turn off highlight mode. Let's go into normals. This is feeding into this input and let's go into, well, since we're in Mystica, um, we have access to the fixed vectors, which is, you know, my favorite tool in Mystica. It's everybody's favorite tool here. And let's see what happens if we just increase the red luminance. Look, it's like, uh, it's like we got this light on a dimmer. I mean, this is pretty incredible. So if, <laughs> if I lower it, the light goes down. If I increase it, the light goes up and then we kind of blow a, blow a fuse here. Um, now, typically with if I, if I increase, if I'm, if I'm messing with the Luma sliders, I'm always going to mess with the neighbors. So I'm not just going to do red, which is a little bit better visualized if you're in the hexagon tool here, right? If I want it, I'm also going to bring up yellow a little bit because there is a little yellow component, right? You see the light reacting. And then I am just for safety going to increase a little bit the magenta as well, um, just to create a, so it's not kind of uh, disturbed there. So we've kind of uh, boosted <laughs> <laughs> the light with a Luma mat here. Let's get Lady sitting down again so we can see her face. Let's also go ahead and increase the saturation. Yeah, that's nice. Let's go in there. This is before and that's after. That's really nice. But Jeff, really I think cool. that this is your oh. first CGI project, right? I mean, because <laughs> you look like- That very... was a secret. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's just because um, <laughs> you, you told me that you actually learned everything about it um, in, in the tutorials, right? Yes. Well, exactly. So I'm just a regular Mystica op, I guess. And so I just had consumed the tutorials that one does. And um, there's a tutorial that Adrian had done. I think it was like an iguana or there's like a lizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is cool, but I'm never going to use this. So, um, but then when Jeff showed me this thing. I was like, hey, how did you, how could you, did you possibly make this short? I mean, this is incredible. And then I did think about that tutorial and I thought about, okay, well, if we're going to work together, obviously we have to find a way to use these tools. Absolutely. Um, it's just a great occasion for it. Um, and so it's, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really amazing to be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, you're really like now, uh, depth great uh, fluent and very mystical fluent. So <laughs> that's, yes. that's really awesome to see. <laughs> learning from tutorials, obviously, so There's great nothing job, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> nothing but time to watch tutorials um, uh, uh, during COVID. Um, cool. Um, let me show you one last, um, basically how to combine the position tool and have the uh, with the depths and the normals um, for one other adjustment, which is a real adjustment we made here, um, which is basically to flag the floor, right? So. Um, obviously, again, like looks beautiful the way it is, but my thought is, it, can we get a little bit of light off that floor? Um, and so we can be looking a little bit more um, at Lady there. So let's do that. So let's go into my uh, a fresh copy of the utility pass, and I'm going to pull a fresh key here. We're going to go into the qualifier. We're going to go to the multi-layer. Again, I'm going to turn on uh, the highlight mode, um, and we're going to start with um, directional light. 
So let's go to directional light here. Let's define which layer we should be looking at, which is the normals layer. And let's click on the ground because I want to flag the ground. So I'm going to start by flagging the ground. And then now we're going to go move through the other passes. So this is where we're going to kind of bring it all together with all three different um, passes available. Now we're going to progress to depth. I'm going to change this to depth. I'm going to change the layer to Z for depth. Now we can pick depth. So let's pick here because I only want to do the floor. So we're pointing at the floor. I don't want to hit anything past there. Um, I'm always going to soften these. So let me turn up the softness a little bit. That's fine. Um, but now the issue is um, they're not getting hit too bad, but I really don't want to darken those cats. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add in position as the final way to like limit or like define this qualifier. So we're going to go for position. We're going to go to position. So we got a position dropper. We're telling it to do the position pass. And in this layer, we're going to go to position. And what we're going to do here is we're going to define the size. All right. Boop. All right. So first we're going to spread out the size like that. And then under, under uh, Y, Y is the height. I'm going to hold Alt and I'm just going to hit down, 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 down until those cats are not getting affected. Um, I'm actually going to change the shape of this to box. Yeah, that's a little bit better. So we don't have those rounded edges. And then I'm going to increase um, the Z size there. And then I just might go for like a little bit more softness here. Right. And then let's bring down Y even more. If you actually hold Alt and Shift in Y, you can make these really tiny adjustments. You see I'm ad adjusting the, I think that's the thousandth place. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't go to school for math. But as you can see, the, the kitten's bittens are getting more and more reduced. It's becoming more and more part of the black. Yeah, let's go for something like this and just a little bit more softness. OK, let's try this as our mat. Let's turn off our qualifier. We're going to go enable the full grade. We're going to go to where we have our qualifier, um, which is here. And then let's go ahead and let's just use lift gamma gain to darken. Look at that. So we've just perfectly darkened behind the cats. We've left the cats lit. Um, so as they cross, they stay lit. And now we have, uh, you know, typically when you darken, at least with lift, lift gamma gain, you might desaturate a little bit. Let's uh, desaturate the floor a little bit. Let's look at the before, you know, and then that's the after there. Um, you know, maybe I want to soften this a little bit more. And so one cool thing about, you know, working with, with the eval tree is, right, we can look at the final grade, right? But I can jump down here to this qualifier. So I'm modifying the qualifier, but looking at the final grade, I'm going to go ahead and go into the qualifier, and I'm just going to go ahead and increase the softness here. So we have a little bit extra softness on that mat. Um, so if we do like a full before, this is a full before of our depth mats, and this is a full after. So you see it's kind of a huge difference. We've got moonlight on the wall, but not on the gramophone. We've got um, orange light on Lady where she's sitting, and then we just have the cats are still lit, but we're just not looking at the floor anymore. Exactly. So yeah. that's it. That's, that's the demo. That's, that's pretty awesome. But uh, I think you promised me that you'll show a little bit some other shots too, because I think um, uh, yes, it, it's it's really nice what you guys did. I mean, the whole aesthetics of of the movie it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Let's have a tour of some of my favorite shots here. So let's enable the storyboard and let us uh, monitor the highest level we've got here. So let's look at, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at this shot. This is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, and so one idea that we had in talking with Jeff and Paul was, you know, we're embellishing the lighting. And we're, we just want to feel the color more. Um, and uh, another main thing that we want to do is just like define this space. So this shot is a direct reverse of the trailer shot, the one that we were just doing. If you were just to, just to turn right around, you would see this part of the house. So how do we have some elements that we were seeing in this shot carry over 
um, to this shot right here. So let me turn off the storyboard just so we have like a little bit more room. Um, and I'm going to go into the uh, the normals node, what I've labeled the normals node. And these are real layers that we have here that I'm going to sort of enable disable. So the first one, I, I'm a labeler. So this one's called warm under. I'm going to disable it. And then I'm going to enable it. And basically what this is, this is before and that's after is, let me show you the qualifier. It's basically under light, right? Like campfire light that would be from the fireplace, which is off screen behind us that's coming in and sort of hitting there. And so this was, if you look at the bands, midtones, it's just a shift towards like an orange, towards like a red in the midtones. Um, I have this one called blue corner, which it's a little bit of a different corner. This is before, that's the after, kind of a strong correction, mm -hmm. but we just wanted a sense of that moonlight. Okay. So it's the very same, I think I probably started by copy pasting the vector that has this, uh, this very same amount of blue with mm -hmm. the bands and the shadows, and then just redefine the um, utility pass, the depth mat to point at this corner. So anytime you're seeing this corner in a shot, it's gonna have this uh, reminder of the moonlight um, in it. And then this is probably my favorite correction. Um, this was making the kitchen a little bit green, mm -hmm. um, a little bit cyan, this is before, and that's after. Mm -hmm. And then this is the mat for that. So, <laughs> oh, well, okay. I mean, this is a colorist. It's just so fun to do that. You could never do this. Um, you know, a client would say, hey, can you just make the kitchen green? And I'd be like, uh, hello, it's, there's someone standing in front of the kitchen. Are you you're not seeing that this is flat like, <laughs> like I am? Um, but, uh, you know, so being able to do that is, is, is sort of quite amazing. I think, I think, it, is it the next shot? Oh, this is a good one just to look at. I mean, because this is like very typical foreground background separation here. So, um, and you can already see here that I've enlisted the help of a shape <laughs> to further cheat and define um, the area. Uh, you know, basically, it's a light on the dog. It's a light mm -hmm. on Jackson. Mm -hmm. You know, this is before, this is after. This is probably one of the bigger differences. Um, I think, uh, Jeff, what you say is we just um, have him a little bit warmer, um, a little bit browner maybe. Um, than he had been. And then you can kind of sort of see that adjustment here. There's actually a little bit of contrast. So shadows are up, mid-tones down, highlights up. And you can see in the curve here, he's got like a little bit of um, of uh, red. Blue window, this would be the same. I mean, the cool thing is these copy paste pretty well because you're kind of using the same geography or you're recycling that some information. And then stove is, I think, what I labeled the light mm -hmm. correction there. It looks like um, we went a little more orange in the actual grade than I did in this uh, in this in this sort of demo here. Um, this is that same shot we just saw, but I think you can see it maybe a little bit better here. Um, just the mat with the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, it has really only getting the kitchen there. Um, and then the warmth, you really feel the warmth here on, you know, death's hands, very red, and then just kind of hitting his cloak, mm -hmm. um, there. And then I think you feel it even more here, uh, on Jackson in the foreground. So if I look at the warmth here, this is before, this is after, you know, you really just feel that. And we should just add in um, one thing we're not showing, I believe Mystica also has the ability to read object IDs. So you can single out uh, the ID for a particular character or for a particular object. Um, again, because we didn't pre-plan this, I tend to use Cryptomat um, as, as the way in post that we select out in comp various objects. My understanding is hopefully that CryptoMat will be supported in future versions of Mystica. Um, but for the moment, we hadn't done it, but you could also have rendered out a, a pass, an object ID pass that would have let you select uh, individual objects and generate mats as well. Yeah, that'll be cool. I'm really looking forward to that. Although yes. it's although this this is a great method to 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 learn on, so I don't cheat too much and just start clicking on people and making them blue and <laughs> clicking making them purple or whatever you know whatever. Um, let's look a few more shots here. Oh, this is so the kitchen was probably my favorite space to grade, mm -hmm. um, just because every time a colorist sees a fluorescent light, they're like, oh, "I'm going to make it green. It's going to be really <laughs> cool. I finally get to use green." So this <laughs> is an example of that. Um, and let me just uh, toggle these for you. So this, I, I wrote top floor as in the top fluorescent. This is the before on that. Um, and this is the after. So as you can see, this is kind of one of the bigger shifts, you know, before mm -hmm. and after. And you can see in the highlights, I mean, it's already, we got 50 points of cyan 
in the highlights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if this were not constrained to um, a qualifier, it would look quite insane. Um, actually, can I do that? Can I just separate it for a second? If I just do uh, and in five, no, it didn't work. Okay. All right, anyway, um, so basic, basically, uh, you know, but the problem with that is when you add a bunch of fluorescent, it just messes up everyone's skin tone, mm -hmm. right? Everyone goes green, which is its own look. It's not the look of this film. Um, you know, Jeff was very clear. It's about the warmth and the hearth of Lady's House. We don't want to have coldness. We don't have mm -hmm. green. So it's like, how do we, um, how do we keep that? You, you know, basically use a mat, right? And so this is just emulating the directionality and the fall off of uh, the top light. Although apparently, I think I did a little work, um, I guess, with depth to keep it off the table. Um, and the reason for that is the table is warm, right? And so you want to, I mean, on like a really high level, one of the goals of color grading is you want to be more colorful, but you don't just want to crank the saturation in general. And so I think one thing that's exciting about CG grading is because you can break the image up into different parts, you're able to do that. You can just make colors more different from each other, not just more. Um, and so here we have like a really nice separation between the green coming in from the ceiling um, and everyone's skin tone and I guess fur tone, dog tone, um, and you know still being uh, still being uh, red out there. And then looks like this is just a little flagging of the table, which had been a little bit hot. Um, I should also just add that you know this is all CG right now, but there are cameras that are uh, usable. They're not used a lot that currently record depth information and output. Uh, depth with live action recording as well. So these tools right now are probably mostly useful for CG project productions, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we're not far off from being able to extract depth info from live action as well. I mean, that's fascinating. That's something that I've been, I've been wondering about. And that, I mean, that's, that's clearly the future of color grading. I mean, hundred <laughs> percent, if that's possible um, and that becomes usable, you know, we get that kind of thing with like a red camera or Alexa Mm -hmm. using these tools. I mean, that's 100% the future of, of color grading. So part of the excitement about doing CG is just the novelty of it. But it's also, yeah, like you said, if that's the future, it's going to be this kind of tool. It's going to be this kind of method of breaking up the um, breaking up the image. Yeah, the, you was, one, uh, the level of control is amazing. So the level of control was huge because as Jeff said, there's so many different colors playing that we you know, wanted to retain that were very important, like the living room, the heart, the warmth, that was really important to Jeff to keep that. But then also that cool, not quite blue moonlight coming in the window and then in the kitchen, the green of the fluorescence, all these colors playing so close together, like to be able to really get in there almost with a scalpel and affect this one, but not that one. Um, that level of control is incredible and something it was like the way that I could put a light in a shot and then have the light disappear with the effect still stay. That level of control that I was never used to before, it was the same thing as the color, like being able to really like just parse stuff out and just this, not that, just that, not this. That was really amazing. That's great. Uh, so why don't we jump to the Q&A um, now? because um, I think that Jeff, you, you need to run in 15 minutes so we can yep. go we have... over the Q and A. Uh, so my colleague Alba is taking care of the questions. Um, so uh, Alba, do we have any questions already uh, there? Yeah, yeah, we have some questions. Um, hey everyone. Um, the first one goes to Jeff. And it says, if you could tell us a little bit more about how you set up the the wild trip. Oh, it's for me. OK, yes, yes. I, I will do that. So this is the eval tree here. And it's uh, kind of one of the awesome things about Mystica. It allows you to monitor um, at a certain level of the comp, but make adjustments at the other level of the comp. So um, let me just back up to the visual editor here. So as you can see, it can get a little bit busy. Let me just go to like a kind of like a more empty stack right here. Um, so the green is the clip. Um, that's going to be the actual uh, movie. Um, and then above that, we've got a unicolor effect. This is taking it from linear, which is how Nuke writes an image, into Rec. 709. And then these are all color grade nodes that I've labeled 
for organizational purposes. Matching would just have like a just a simple exposure adjustment. It's just taking care of the shot to shot matching. They, you know, it's CG, so it's near perfect. I think as Jeff uh, brought up the other day, though, every shot is its own comp, and so while it's more or less the same exposure, you still need to kind of even it out. So that's just like a simple like a lift gamma gain type adjustment. Um, normals is what I should have called depth mats. Um, it's what I was just demoing right now. It's all the shapes. Um, and then tone is that little push, pull, orange, blue tweak. And then trim is just a final in the session with Jeff and Paul, just like a final touch, like just make it a little darker, a little brighter, just something you want on top of everything, just parking that white point, parking that black point. Um, now what's interesting here is you have um, multiple copies of the utility pass. And that's because each one can provide one mat. Um, so each one has its own color grade node, in two, in three, in four. I relabeled the color grade node as in two, in three, in four, just because I know that now this is going to be the second input to this node, right? You can see this normals uh, is grabbing everything right here. Um, and whereas this mat is going to be input three. So when I'm actually in here, in my normals, uh, if I'm, I, I have actually labeled my vectors like that too, just so I can see I've got one vector per input. So if I go to my vector that I've labeled input five, I know that I can just go to my color grade node at input five, I can pull a key and that's gonna export. You can actually see if I've got in a qualifier here, I am export key inside, right? And then I can then pick that up here um, in, my, in my normals. If I go into the qualifier, what I'm doing is I'm merging a key and input five. So anything in input five is going to be the key of this shot. Okay. So uh, we had one for Jeff. And it said, if you could explain uh, a little bit, uh, how did you export the utility pass? Sure. Um, it's a pretty, uh, utility passes are pretty common. Um, I will say that for colorists, the, the big change here is that normally as a colorist, you know, you kind of get the final comp or the final uh, edit or whatever. <clears throat> um, and you might get some mats and then you usually call up the post house and you're like, hey, I need a mat for the dog and they generate one for you. Th these are coming out of 3D. So these, the utility passes are generated uh, directly out of Houdini, in my case, out of Redshift. Um, and then they could be piped through Nuke if you wanted to go that route. So it's really important that you, that the colorist be part of the post discussion about what passes get kicked out. These are pretty common. I would say that any CG project is gonna kick out a depth pass um, for speed. Normals and world position, you know, may not be kicked out, but are super, the normals was probably next to depth, the most useful pass that we, uh, that we used. And so it's important just to make sure that when they're, you know, and all of this happens weeks before you get the footage. So you want to make sure that uh, the, the post house is kicking out normals and world position um, when they're doing their 3D renders and including that. Uh, as for how you do that, it's pretty simple. In Redshift, you just click, uh, to make a separate AOV, um, which is a separate pass uh, for normals, a separate pass for depth. We usually do one for motion, for, for motion blur and comp, uh, one for world, world position, et cetera. Um, and then, as I said, I always render those out as a separate render from the beauty passes because you don't need reflection. You don't really need textures in that. It could just be a clay render if you wanted it. Um, so they go much, much faster. So I always separate those out into a completely separate render. Um, so if you have to update your utility pass for some reason, it goes much faster. Okay, so let's move to the next one. And um, Eduardo would like to know uh, about the grain added to the movie. Um, well, I can take a pass on that first. Uh, and then, you know, Jeff and Paul, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it um, as well. You know, it's funny, it's not that different. I mean, we've been talking about all these like very technical tools, but it's no, it's really no different than doing a color grade um, on a live action film. I think Paul will attest to that. It felt very similar to what we do with live action. What you're really trying to do is I think a mixture of altering colors for their narrative value. Um, 
you know, a lot of it was emphasizing that that under light, which was coming from um, coming from the fireplace, which for me was very much in this kind of lonely, there's a storm going on outside. There's a lot of things that could make this feel very cold and lonely, but it's that warm under light that made it feel, and those two practical lights that made it feel homey. Um, so you're trying to adjust colors for their emotional value. And then you're trying to adjust colors for clarity, for separation, so that your eye goes to the right place at the right time. Um, and I think the big change for me was that I think most of the time color feels like a process after comp, after compositing. And what I think what these tools really do is they bring the colors, the color session into the overall process of lighting um, and, and comp and, and make it part of that process. And it needs, needs to be thought of that way um, by the post supervisor. For sure. I think on the, on the grain, um, one of the one of the amazing things of, about the short the blooming way is the texture that jeff built into everything i mean you know jackson's the like tiny hairs on jackson's fur and he, he essentially looks like he's made out of burlap or fabric and there's so much texture overall and grain kind of adds a visual component to that texture which makes it feel a little more organic and um just real and we just kind of found an appropriate level of grain to add and it just kind of accentuated all of that texture that's in that jeff was able to put into the the animation which really i mean you should see it on as big a screen as you can because it's amazing what he was able to create okay so uh, we have another one. This is from Julia, and it says, "Is um, how all this match uh, selection behave with uh, camera movement, and if you had to animate the selection so they could stay in place?" That's a good question because there is a shot that has camera movement. I think it is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff got lucky that. Uh... <laughs> We purposely, it was, there was a stylistic decision made very early on to uh, have static camera in almost every shot. This is one of the few exceptions. I remember wondering about that. I think I did have to, and we can look right now. We're going to find out what, what happened. <laughs> Let's see. Um, it looks like I did not animate it. So there must be a little bit of a shift. So I, I actually didn't know how it was going to uh, translate um, if basically the depth information was going to be just kind of fixed on the space or if it was going to be relative to the camera. It seems like it's relative to the camera. So if the camera moves, then I think you're, you're, um, you would have to animate that. You would have to go in and keyframe that if you want it to stay perfectly fixed. I think. Although, <laughs> although I'll say that, um, again, this is one of the places where colorists aren't normally connected as closely to the, the CG department, let alone the comp department, there certainly are ways you can you can render out depth passes centered so that your one or your zero would be at focus. And then it goes to zero or, or, or infinity, depending on how you set it up, as you get further away from the focal plane. So if you had a big, you could either keyframe it, or if you had a really big sweeping camera move, you could render that out with the focal plane at say zero and you wouldn't have to animate it. That's, That's pretty cool. So again, it takes a little, it's more work with um, the CG and, and comp departments than I think both sides are normally used to. I'm also seeing a drop down here that I was wondering about that I wonder if it's related about select distance, off focus distance, parallax. I'm not sure if that's related. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jeff, I think you can take the next one. Um, it says, uh, how was the conform process inside Mystica? Oh, good question. Um, yeah. It was it was pretty easy. There was one thing that was like a little bit uh, that was a little bit fun about it, which is this, which is that the um, you know because this is kind of like a stop animation style. I think the effective frame rate is uh, twelve, 
right? Or is it eight actually? It's actually it's eight. eight. It's eight. So let me just bring a fresh comp over here and let me bring the utility pass over here. Basically, uh, you know, in order to save render time, Jeff did not render every single frame because it was always like three repeated frames and then another, um, then it would move to the next frame. So what I ended up doing was time warping, uh, using a time warp group mm -hmm. to basically multiply by three that, um, so like if I go into the time warp group here, you'll see that, oops, um, it's actually uh, one third the amount of frames that were ultimately required that were ultimately needed. And basically, uh, how do I ungroup? Ungroup. Yeah, there we go. So this is what I got from Jeff. Um, so at, at first I was super confused. So this is the actual shot. And then this is the utility pass. And I thought, oh, why doesn't that line up? And then I realized, okay, I've got to actually slow this down. So it's the same duration. And that's when I realized that the best way to do this and the best way to speed things up in general is um, I can just put this in. I just did a little gesture to get the duration of this. Just multiply it by three, right? And then I'm going to set the duration like that. And then there are a little bit of handle, so that's complex. That's why it didn't work immediately. But that's basically then you time warp it and uh, you have it set up. But that's that was the only thing that was a little bit of a troubleshooting with the conform. But otherwise, the uh, um, the XML you know worked. If that's what you're asking. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna take the last one, and um, this one is for all of you. And um, uh, what would be their advice on CGI workflow? I mean, I, I think for Jeff and um, for Paul is the first um, CGI thing. So, any advice for their colorist or DP for their first time? For for grading, any any advice for grading? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, don't change too much. That would be, <laughs> that would be my <laughs> advice. Don't change don't change too much, that, yeah. and um, you know think about complementary colors. I would mm -hmm. uh, you know I would I would say as well. So like um, I can jump in here real quick. Like on you just kind of want to think uh, you want to think a little bit about um, you know what colors are you know, opposite each other. So for instance, on this shot, uh, let me turn off, the, it, you know, on, on this shot, um, you know, this is before we had some color separation. You see, it's like not, let me turn off the, you know, it's, it's, it's a great shot, but it's actually a little bit pale compared to where we ended here by introducing green in the background. Um, green is a complementary color to red, well, cyan, cyan's complementary color to red, but keeping the red in the foreground on her face right now, you're kind of able to create three-dimensionality. Um, so that I would say is something to think about right here. So this is toggling the warmth. You know, if you check out her face here, that's before, that's after. Uh, and if you look at the background, that's before, that's after. Anytime you can kind of get that complementary uh, palette in there, do it. Mm -hmm. Paul or Josh, anything else? I mean, I would, uh, I would agree with what Jeff says, but don't change too much. Um, you know, you, you've got to have a pretty clearly defined vision of where you're going from the start. And it's always my um, hope to get in as close to possible there when you're making you know, in, during sort of the production phase before it goes in the post. So post is really just about accentuating, sweetening, and um, finishing, you know. Um, so try to get it 85, 90% of the way there. And then the last 10% is really just, just making all those colors and flavors richer and deeper. And um, don't, don't, save it to fix anything, which in CG, it, 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 you have so much control going into it from this experience that I've had that you really are able to get things much closer to the way you would imagine them. Um, so it's really about just, you know, crossing the finish line with style and really taking it home, which is, you know, what Jeff did, Jeff Houston did. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is kind of what I started with, which is I think for everyone at every part of the process, 
don't fall into doing things because it's what everyone else does and because it's the standard. Um, you know, sometimes there's a look that we all in commercial work that we fall into um, or are asked to do. And sometimes it has reasons, the blue in the shadows, and, you know, and yet warm in the, in the highlights helps separate faces from the background. That's why we do it. Um, but, you know, you go to see every blockbuster movie and they all look the same. And you have these tools and you could do whatever you want without doing too much, but you can do whatever you want. Why, is, why do all movies these days look the same? Why do all CG animations look the same? I think one of the things about working with really talented people, and you know, I experienced this working with Paul and with Jeff is, you know, if you start from the story and what you're trying to get your audience to feel, um, then you go through the process of experimenting with, well, what are the right colors? Uh, what's the right contrast? what's the right level of grain or don't use grain. You know, I think there's some, you know, I'd like to see some stuff that's super crisp and has no grain and super deep depth of field, you know, wide depth of field that looks totally different. There might, there's a piece that that's right for, um, but let the content dictate the style rather than the other way around. Well, I think that's actually a very great thought to finish this session. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, Paul and Jeff uh, for, sharing your experience uh, with us today. I think it was really amazing. And I think that our attendees really learned a lot about uh, your movie on one end and got a lot of inspirational thoughts on how to do their work from now on. And of course, uh, I think they really learned a lot um, about all the creative possibilities that they get working with Mystica. So thank you very much again uh, for joining us. And um, if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out whenever you want through social media or sending us an email to marketing at sgo.s. Uh, if you haven't tried Mystica yet, you can download it uh, completely free of charge from our website. Uh, you have the evaluation version available and you also have a free of charge educational version available too. So I think that's me. Uh, thank you again and uh, see you in the next session. Thanks for having thank us. Guys. Thank, thank you. you for having us. That's great.